Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. you have any questions of what we covered yesterday? Anything at all? We left off at the naming of children, sons, daughters, right? You with everybody with me? Okay. Oop, okay. Bar and bat, bat mitzvah. Anybody ever been to a bar mitzvah before? Bat mitzvah. Nobody. Okay. What? The, the question is about uh, braided bread. Braided bread is a, is a special bread. It's actually a Sabbath bread. It's called a challah. Uh, if you live in Chicago, they call it chali. I don't know why they do that, but uh, we lived in Chicago a number of years. That's what they call it. But it's a double bread, a yellow bread. Uh, and the reason it's double is because of the double portion of manna that they were to collect the day before the Sabbath. And so it's a braided bread. But, and yes, at a bar mitzvah, at the reception, or even right after the uh, synagogue service, they, they would probably have a blessing of the bread, and it would be challah, because the bar mitzvah usually takes place on Shabbat, when they read the scripture. So, uh, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, a bar for a boy, bat for a girl. Um, it actually means son of commandment. Let me give you a, uh, an understanding of what bar mitzvah is. Uh, since most of you have never attended um, a bar mitzvah, in America it's pretty unique uh, in that the reception is actually viewed more important, especially by the bar mitzvah boy or the bat mitzvah girl. Um, in many instances, the, the bar mitzvah is called the wedding for the, for the boy. They're big bashes. They, are, they tend to be very expensive. They're catered. Uh, 13-year-old boy invites all his friends and relatives come. It's a big, big deal. And depending on the family, can end up costing thousands of dollars for the reception at very nice hotels. Uh, oftentimes in America, uh, families who are uh, more uh, Zionistic and interested in Israel will often fly to Israel and have a bar mitzvah either at the Western or Wailing Wall or even at Masada, uh, often do that. So it, it just depends, but it is a big, big deal. And it is a big deal... Uh, for uh, a couple of reasons. From the religious side, it's a big deal because when the boy turns 13, and that's the he turns 13, it physically happens if you're healthy to everyone who's born. You turn 13 years old, but according to Judaism, according to tradition, when you're 13, you have now become a man. You are now a man. Now, uh, in the movie, uh, if for those of you saw it yesterday, you saw there are a couple pictures at the bar mitzvah, still pictures. Uh, two of those pictures were was me uh, when I was 13 years old. I was about four eight and maybe weighed about 75 pounds or 80 pounds. Um, so I stood next to my father, who is about my height now. And I look short, but according to Judaism, uh, without even being able to shave, I was a man. I'm considered a man. Now, what does that mean? In our culture, being a man, and well, you go out, you get a job, you can start a family. Well, I'd submit to you, uh, in days of old, in biblical days, when a young man turned 13, he was a man. And... Um, in Judaism, 
if the parents have done what they are supposed to do, which was raise you up in the, literally in the admonition of the Lord, you would be equipped and ready to do all the things required uh, to follow the commandments in the Bible. And so at 13 years old, uh, the uh, bar mitzvah boy will be at the synagogue and he will come forth to read from the Torah scroll. That gives him, that's a privilege, number one, anytime you can uh, make Aliyah, Aliyah, come forth and read the text, that's a privilege. In the New Testament, Jesus read from the text. The text of Scripture happened to be Isaiah. It's recorded in the Gospels, in, in Luke, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, and Jesus read from the Scripture. That's a regular thing that happens in, in the synagogue. Set readings are to happen. Uh, some people think in the Gospel that Jesus just happened to turn to Isaiah chapter 61. I'm not one of those people. I believe that there's a regular uh, reading of the, of the Torah and of the prophets, and that would have been the appointed time to read. And in the providence of God, in my view, Jesus was just reading. I think he foreknew that. I think it was all set, predetermined, um, but was stepping up to read at just that right time. And so the only way you can come forth and read the scriptures is you have to be recognized in the community as a legitimate son who has become a man uh, and, you're, and you're now reading from the text. That's what a bar mitzvah means from a religious point of view. Reading, uh, being able to be part of a minion, to corporately pray, pray, and also to come forth and read from the Torah scroll and from the prophets. And so that's a big deal. Now, if you're Orthodox, many Orthodox rabbis say this, there's too much bar and very little mitzvah. Now, if you understand the terminology, it's a funny statement. The idea from, from their point of view is because of this emphasis, especially in Western culture, uh, of the reception, of uh, the, the big parties that are thrown, and certainly a liquor being served, rabbis would be upset because the emphasis of the bar mitzvah, the son of the commandment, should be that now he's a responsible man who can uh, be part of a corporate prayer, who is responsible for doing the commandments found in the scripture. Uh, that's really important, and yet society, uh, Jewish society and tradition, emphasizes the party. The very the gals dress up real nice. If you remember the video, you could see the tuxedo. The 13-year-old boy had a tuxedo on. Um, that kind of is the stress that they have. So technically, the bar mitzvah is not a ceremony. It happens. Physically, it happens. The ceremony comes into play when the person who's being bar mitzvah has the privilege of exercising the fact that he's a man, and using the privilege to come forward and read from the text. In order to do that, it requires training. So, from the time a Jewish youngster is small, either he'll be trained at home, which is, was the days of old, but in more modern times, he'll go to school. A Hebrew school, a special tutor, however it's going to be done, uh, you have to learn how to read from the Torah scroll, which, by the way, uh, the Hebrew script has no vowels. Uh, it has to be chanted. There's a certain way to chant it, and the only way uh, for most young men and women uh, who are more liberal who will do it is to memorize it, to learn it, to go over it over and over again. It takes, it takes a, a, a while in order for that to happen, and there's a great celebration for it as well. So he's now responsible to obey the commandments from 13 years and on. In Jewish culture, particularly Western culture, but certainly in Israel 
and which would certainly be classified Western. They're Western thinkers. Uh, what often happens is after the bar mitzvah, at 13 years old, they drop out of Hebrew school. They drop out of training. Uh, most families will turn to their kids. They'll make them go and learn all the things they have to learn. But after their bar mitzvah, a good percentage of them stop. Uh, so unlike the Christian tradition, although arguments are very similar in either Christian home or Jewish home, uh, many Christian homes, the teenagers don't want to go to meeting, uh, have their issues, but if you compare them, uh, Christian parents seem to win out because uh, uh, usually it goes, they, they continue to go. Not all the time, but in Judaism they tend to stop. When the bar mitzvah happens, the father says a prayer, which in essence says, thank God my son's sins no longer fall on me. In Judaism, the idea is that the father is responsible for his chil children's actions until they reach accountability. And the age of accountability in Judaism is 13. If you're a, a gal, uh, conservative and reform uh, synagogues don't, uh, I mean they have allow for bat mitzvahs, orthodox Judaism doesn't have bat mitzvahs. Um, it would be the orthodox who would emphasize the sin aspect, not the reform and the conservatives. Uh, Reform Judaism and conservative have bat mitzvah mainly because of the pressure politically that, uh, that has gone on uh, with women and women's rights and all that. And it's, it's kind of grown as society has uh, insisted on those kinds of things. So uh, 100 years ago, there were, it, it actually bat mitzvah started in Germany. There were a couple of them. There were a few of them. They were far apart. Not too many uh, gals got bat mitzvahed, but uh, now it's very, very common. Very common. But Orthodox Judaism will not allow for that. So, but there is this belief on the part of uh, uh, Orthodox Jewish people that oh, he's now a man. He's now responsible for his own actions. His own sins fall on him. And so the father's pretty happy. He's a pretty happy person. Um, now he's able to be part of a minion, a corporate prayer, and he must don the phylacteries. Now I'll show you, uh, you saw some in the film. I'll show you later on. I'll be showing you some pictures of phylacteries. Um, the phylacteries come from um, Deuteronomy, which says, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, it also talks about, you shall post it on the doorpost uh, and on your gates. That's from Deuteronomy 6 as well. There, that prayer, and we'll be talking about this a little later, is called the Shema. Very important prayer, the Shema. The Shema is the uh, a declaration of Jewish faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And it goes on to outline the commandments. And the first time that a young man puts on his uh, tefillin, uh, outside of practicing it, first time officially he puts it on is when he becomes a son of, command, of the commandment a bar mitzvah boy. So he wraps those straps around his arm. There's a little box which contains the scripture. It points to his heart. There's a, another box that is attached to straps that fit around the head and it sits right on his forehead. And the idea is that every morning a Jewish man is to get up and tell God, I love you. I love you with every part of my being. And in fact, by strapping on the phylacteries, the tefillin, 
He is saying, God, you own my heart and you own my brain. Well, if God owns your heart and he owns your brain, how much of you does he own? We'd say, well, all of us. He owns the whole, whole part of me. That's exactly right. Christians, uh, we're supposed to have devotions, and there's all kinds of books that I've read. I remember doing a, a paper on it when I was in school, uh, interviewing people. It, it's a, everyone does it a little bit different as far as their devotions, and people have struggled through the years. Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, doesn't have that struggle. Um, the reason is you must do it at a certain time when you wake up. Uh, it's to be done right away. And it's not just to be done by reading something. You have to do something as well. By strapping on the phylacteries, first thing we say is, God, I love you with all my heart and soul. Those scripture verses are pointed to your heart and, to, and on your head. And so they're communicating uh, to God uh, that, that you love him and are committed to him. Now, it's done in a liturgy, which is different from a Christian devotion. Um, Christians do devotions in any number of ways, and there's all kinds of different things that you can do. But in Judaism, it's a structure. There's a certain way to do it, and it's got to be done all the time. Okay? Okay. So when a bar mitzvah happens, there's the reading of the Haftorah, which is a portion of the prophets. There's the Torah scroll, the five books of Moses, and there's the portion of Scripture, which is the Haftorah from, from the prophets. A speech is going to be given. So the young man gets up and he thanks all the people that have uh, impacted his life uh, at 13 years old. So he thanks his mom, he thanks his dad, he'll thank his grandparents if they're alive, and his sisters and brother, or whatever. He goes right through, but it's a speech. It's uh, probably the first public speech uh, for most families, it is. Um, but it's done, and it's, it's the parents and the family look forward. That's a special part. For many families, the speech is almost as important, if not more important, than the public reading of the text itself. Because, again, this is a, a highly celebrated event uh, with family there. So it's a big celebration. Okay. Those who are not Orthodox, uh, feeling the pressure of uh, women participating, and that's happening now in Orthodox Judaism as well. Uh, and there's a... a amongst churches as well. Churches are going through the same thing. Um, there is um, the desire on the part of, of many women to participate in spiritual things. In, in fact, Judaism and Christianity are a lot alike in that if you were to look in a synagogue and in a church, you would find a common denominator, and that is there's usually more women at a church than men and at a synagogue than men. Uh, that's just kind of the way it is. And so uh, conservative and reform uh, congregations have said that women mature faster, girls mature faster than boys. So it's 13 for a boy. It's going to be 12 years old for a girl. She, too, will read a portion of the, of the text, uh, come forward and read. But... Remember our conversation about clean and unclean from an Orthodox point of view? That's why uh, in an Orthodox setting, a woman would never be allowed to stand on the bima, never be allowed to hold the Torah scroll uh, for that reason. Whereas conservative and reform congregations, that's not an issue. That's just not an issue that they worry about. They, it's, it's much more of a concern from an Orthodox point of view. Um, so the first time it took place was in 1922, and Judith Kaplan uh, uh, was the first bat mitzvah girl. Uh, 
and Mordecai Kaplan, a big name amongst Jewish people, a uh, very liberal rabbi, uh, very w learned as well. Marriage. Now you can see, okay, you can see right there is the, it's called the chuppah. Anybody ever been to a Jewish wedding by chance? No, okay. Uh, spectacular things to go to. But if you can ever get to a bar mitzvah or a Jewish wedding, they're usually amazing, just amazing. And um, the thing that's best known, maybe you've seen movies or TV shows uh, where Jewish wedding takes place. That might, you might be familiar. And the number one thing, if they were filming it uh, in a TV or, or movie, this would be the thing that defines the wedding. There'd be two things that would define it, the chuppah and the breaking of the glass. Th those two things would definitely be included. And by the way, some liberal-minded Jewish people, that is, reform Jewish people, that might be the only religious thing they have. That's what they'd insist upon having, because that defines, again, the, their identity as Jewish people. So, just as we said in the movie yesterday, in the film, from an Orthodox point of view, marriage is extremely important. And usually, the more conservative or orthodox the Jewish family, the younger they get married. Um, usually, the more liberal, the chances are they would, the couple will be a little bit older. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why that is, but the main reason from an uh, observant point of view is that marriage is stressed, having Having children, uh, again, the more orthodox they are, the more children they're going to have. You'll find that amongst the Hasidim, the ultra-orthodox families, they coincide very closely to those who are strict Catholics. Strict Catholic families usually have a large number of children. So do the Hasidim, uh, because both groups tend not to use any kind of artificial birth control. Uh, the only kind they'll use is natural birth control. And so the families tend to be larger. Uh, but the average Jewish family, the average Jewish family has two kids, uh, by and large. Because remember, the majority of Jewish people are not Orthodox. The majority tend to be more liberal. Any questions so far? Yes. Do they have arranged marriages or? The amongst some of the ultra Orthodox or Hasidim, especially rabbis, rebbies, as they be called, they might. They might. But it's it's a small small percentage, and under normal circumstances most Jewish people would thumb their nose at the idea of somebody doing that. But there are examples of it, but it'd be very small, very, very small. Uh, very important in terms of, if you, if you aspire to be a rabbi, being married is very important. Um, it, 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 unless the wife's dead, dies, uh, that Obviously, the rabbi could, wouldn't be married, uh, but very seldom is a rabbi a rabbi and not married. Um, it's pretty much, uh, it's very important that he, that he be married. Now, the Bible outlines certain forbidden marriages. So you just turn to the pages of Scripture, and you find that relatives, the Bible is explicit in the, in the relatives and how far... Uh, distant relatives could be, um, so no blood relations. Um, divorce is possible and happens in Judaism. Uh, when it happens, they need to get, again, this would be for religious folks, it needs, they need to get a get, G-E-T. A get is a document um, that is, uh, there's a council that meets that approves the divorce. Now remember, this is a religious 
thing. How important is a get? It's only as important as the people who need one. And wh what do I mean by that? Well, if you're a liberal Jewish person, you're non-observant, we'll use that expression, okay, you're, you're going to get a divorce. Um, getting a get, going before a council to receive this get, doesn't really mean a whole lot to you because what matters to you is the law of the land. So you'll get a lawyer, uh, the spouse will get a lawyer, uh, the lawyers will dicker, you pay them what they have to pay, you'll pay whatever it is or the arrangements will be made, you divorce and you move on. If you want to get married again, according to the civil government, in this case the United States, as long as you have a legal divorce and the other person you're married is not marrying is not married, can get married. If, however, you're observant, where Judaism is very important to you, if you want to get married again and you don't have a get, you cannot marry in that Orthodox synagogue. There won't be an Orthodox rabbi around who will marry you. So, if you are religious, that get becomes very, very important. Similarly, uh, you've heard in Catholicism the idea of marriages that have gone on for a long time and then they, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, annulment. That's right, annulment. How do they get annulled in Catholicism? Well, they go to the right church, they do what they have to do, and they get their annulment. Judaism is very much the same way. There have been all kinds of, it can be difficult. I, I know of, uh, personally of, a, of an acquaintance of mine who um, he was divorcing his wife. Um, she would not, she fought him on the get uh, for whatever reason. And until he came up with, a right amount of money, uh, she wasn't going to, he wanted to get married again in a, in a synagogue. So the get becomes important. It's, that's what it's become, but the purpose of the get was to go before council. The council makes sure that the reasons for divorce are, are correct and right, and that the situation is taken care of properly. They're looking out for both parties, but specifically the woman. Because when a marriage takes place, they have what's called a ketubah. Ketubah is a contract. It is not legally bound, bound, binding in uh, civil governments, but it is morally binding in Judaism. That is, there are certain things laid out for the man to make sure he takes care of his wife. If he violates those things, that is grounds for divorce. The council meets, they, uh, they have a get. That's given to the woman uh, in order for the divorce to take place. Are you with me? Okay. The word mamzer, very bad word, by the way. I know we're on tape. It is a bad word. If you ever hear that word, it's a Yiddish word. It's not a good word. And it is a word used for illegitimate child. An illegitimate child. Um, and so if a child is born because of an illicit relationship, whatever it is, um, that's the word, that's what they call that child. And so people use that name like they do in other languages and cultures as well. They pick a bad name and throw it out even if it's not true. So that name is, is not a good one and important because uh, that would stigmatize, again, this would be in an orthodox setting, uh, mostly. Question? That's exactly right. The, quest the question was, what about Jesus? Uh, wasn't he accused? The, the fact is, I have heard uh, Jewish people say that about Jesus. And, in fact, if... Um, it was not a miracle birth. 
what happened to Miriam, Mary, if it was not a miracle birth, if the Holy Spirit did not come upon her and she was pregnant under normal circumstances, then yes, that baby born would have been an illegitimate child. So if you have problems believing that a virgin uh, can have a baby, as Joseph did at first, it took God to intervene to make sure he understood that. One of my objections early on when I first heard the gospel was I believed it was a cover-up. I thought the whole thing was a cover-up, that, you know, Mary was fooling around. And uh, she had a baby and they came up with a story. I, I believe that. Now there's a problem. Uh, and I learned real quickly most Jewish people have trouble with the virgin birth. I understand that, by the way. However, let's think of what we talked a little bit about yesterday very quickly, but let's go back there and think through it. Judaism, that is biblical Judaism, was founded Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, as we talked about, okay? Abraham, the story in the Bible, Abraham is approaching a hundred years old, 99. His wife is 89. Three visitors come in Genesis chapter 18. You might remember the story. Three visitors come and they announce that a year from now, Sarah is going to have a baby. Sarah laughs. This is hysterical. Why is Sarah laughing? Well, simple. She knows her body. Um, I suppose she looked in the mirror and she could see her husband and you know what? It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And so when the three visitors come and make this announcement, she laughs and wouldn't you know that a year later, laughter is born. Isaac means laughter. So, I am telling you, as a Jewish person, I had a hard time. I thought it was a joke that Mary, a virgin, had a baby. Yet, Judaism was birthed on a birth that was impossible. But it happened. So, without going into what happened with Jesus, let's just say, uh, from a Jew, again, an observant point of view, that is, I look at the Bible, the Jewish scriptures, and I accept them, which I did before I became a believer. I accepted the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. Do I believe that God uh, did a miracle so that an 89-year-old woman can be impregnated by her 99-year-old husband? Answer, yes, I do. Once you believe that, you have to remove the concept, oh, no, Mary, Mary didn't, it, that's impossible. So all I'm saying is if one is true, if Abraham fathered a child at his age and her age, then it is at least possible. If, you, if one can happen, then the other can happen. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't prove it. It only removes the, the, the possibility of saying it's impossible for that to happen. Judaism was birthed ultimately by a baby, baby Isaac, who not even his mother thought that it would ever happen. And it did. That's all I'm saying. So, uh, so there's a, a time, Judaism is always built with some rules and regulations as to how you should behave. So in the case of a divorced or widowed person, there is a certain length of time. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever had a discussion, or maybe you know of an instance uh, personally uh, where someone has passed away and the person who's left gets married again. When is too soon? Well, I've been involved in those kinds of discussions. Maybe, maybe you have as well. Uh, in Judaism, at least, 
there's a minimum. If, if you, first of all, if you're Orthodox and you get married before then, you violated the law. They don't want to do that, so they will usually wait. Conservative and Reform aren't so much interested in the law as they are, how does it appear? What's it look like? Uh, is how much time is enough time? I've done my own, I've asked uh, Christians that question. Um, young people, middle-aged people, pretty much from, there's no consensus at all, and it's not scientific, but I can tell you the results of my little survey uh, has been that pretty much most people don't get bent out of shape if it's around a year. Around a year, pretty much. But anything less than that, and I've seen young and, and old say, no, that's horrible. You don't do that. Now, we don't have any, Christianity doesn't have any of those kind of laws. Judaism does. So it's a settled issue. Um, they know how long to wait. Okay, wait a minute. I think I... Okay, here we are. The marriage ceremony. Um, there you can see the chuppah. This is the ketubah. Ketub and here's the signing of the ketubah. Now, there's a ketubah here, and there's a ketubah here. There is no... Uh, the, the decoration of the, of the words can be anything. Uh, different artists do ketubahs. Uh, so, it, it, you know, you see one here, and that's got... That's in the shape of the chuppah, and they put the words here. Here they did it like a nice uh, document and then put the words there. Question. Um, I think you said last night that you are married to a Gentile woman. I am married to a Gentile woman. Now, did you have a Jewish wedding? Did a rabbi perform the Jewish wedding? No. no? The, the question is, did I have a rabbi perform the wedding? Uh, the answer to that is, I was a believer when I, uh, when, when I got married. And the criteria for me was not having a rabbi. By the way, there'd be, I could have probably found a reform rabbi, but that wouldn't have meant much to, much to me. That meant a whole lot. Having a rabbi meant a lot to my parents who did not go to the wedding because it wasn't a rabbi. You see, and the reason it was I didn't have a rabbi is because, uh, and my parents wouldn't understand that, and many Jewish people wouldn't understand that is the idea of the wedding is, again, Jewish identity, not belief, identity. Um, and so getting a rabbi, so think of this, and I'm not being critical of my parents at all. I understood exactly where they're coming from. They, would have not, they wouldn't have cared what rabbi I got. Whoever you could find who is a rabbi, that's what we want. From my vantage point, and the person I was marrying, uh, belief is very important. The whole ceremony involves commitments where belief is the central focus of what you're trying to accomplish. By the way, that struggle is with a lot of people, Jewish, Gentile, and Christians. For instance, if you're secular, uh, Getting married is important from a legal point of view. That's, you could go to Las Vegas and go to a place. They're all certified. You could do it real quick, uh, and it's perfectly legal. They have the witnesses, etc. Some people look at the Vegas idea of getting married and say, that's not the way I want my wedding. Why? Well, because that's, that's too flippant. Okay, so they might have a church wedding. Okay, a church wedding, does it matter who is doing the ceremony or what church experience? If they're not religious people, probably not. Unless they were raised in a certain tradition. Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, whatever it is. So all I'm saying is identity is, in Judaism, more important amongst conservatives and more liberal people than it would be orthodox. Um, my parents, I was raised in an orthodox home, but by that time, by the time I was married, uh, they, weren't, they weren't really strong orthodox Jews anymore, but their identity as Jews, very strong. So what did I do? I said to them, 
I am getting married, not in a church. I wasn't going to be in a synagogue, obviously, but I'm not getting married in a church. And the person that married us, uh, many of you can identify with, was not called a reverend uh, because the uh, brethren tradition doesn't use that term. And I, we had somebody who was from a brethren tradition. So I told my parents he's not a rabbi, but he's not a reverend either. Uh, and, uh, and we're not going to a church or a synagogue. We're going to get married in a home, my wife's home. But that for my parents, that the re if, it's not, if you're not going to identify yourself with Judaism, we don't want any part of that. Very normal. That's a very normal, and, so I, and I, under, I understood it. And so identity becomes real important. For instance, the ketubahs. Okay, do most Jewish people, when they sign the ketubah, by the way, big deal, it's a big deal, and I, I'm not being flippant about it. It is a big deal. The camp, you, you hire a person to do a, uh, pictures or video, they're going to come, the, the groom and the bride, and they sign the, they sign the ketubah. It's a big deal. Um, do they really, is it, I mean, they might even put it up on their, New home that they go to move into. It's, it's got the ketubah and it's framed. I've been in homes like that. What's more important? Well, usually what's more important is having it, not necessarily following what it's all about or believing what it's all about. It's much more identity. And so I, but I don't want to miscommunicate with you. Uh, the tradition is very important. And by the way, in the New Testament, Paul says, the Jewish people are zealous without what? If you know Romans 10, zealous without knowledge. There's an ignorant, being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, haven't submitted to the righteousness of God. They're ignorant, they're zealous, but they're zealous without knowledge. And so Jewish people called out by God have this rich tradition we are passionate about our identity. And while 50% are marrying out of their faith, out of Judaism, there is a strong identity. You were saying mixed marriage, but the Jewish uh, father? Yeah. Secular, totally secular, very secular, yet I'm Jewish. Accurate? Very accurate. That's... It is amazing how important this identity is, which is fixated in the Bible. It's, that's where we find out we're Jewish. That's how it happens. And for the bulk of Jewish people, that is extremely important, yet without substance. That's not a critical statement. I'm, again, it is, it is who we are. We, in the Bible, when you read about the Jewish people, did they know they were Jewish? Yes. The Bible says we're stiff-necked people, uh, hard-headed people, hard, we, we're stubborn people. We rebel against God, yet we're the chosen ones. That's in God's plan. That's the way he, he does it. But So you have these rules and regulations that aren't necessarily followed, but I'm telling you in a liberal Jewish home, if there's a wedding, they're going to have the ketubah, and they're going to have, I mean, they're going to have the ketubah, and they're going to have the chuppah as well. They're going to, and they're going to hit the glass, too. Even if they don't believe one word of it, if they, if it, they don't even know why they do it, because it, I, it identifies them. It is who they are. And that is really important. Um, so, I'll give you an a appendum to the story. My parents did not go to my wedding. They never told me they regretted that. We we a close family, very close family. Ultimately, we had uh, four children. Uh, my parents lived to see uh, their oldest granddaughter get married. Their oldest granddaughter met her husband in this place, Emmaus Bible College and got married in the, whichever the direction, the chapel, down there, that way, okay? 
when I called my parents to tell them that their granddaughter was getting married, before I finished getting it out, they said immediately, whenever it is, wherever it is, we'll be there. Now, what, what happened? Did they ever say, boy, you know, we, shouldn't, we should have come. We're your parents. We should have come to your work. No, they never said that. I, I wasn't expecting them to say it. But in a sense, they did say it. Because when they came to Emmaus Bible College, the Saturday before was graduation, and they were there, sitting in that marble chapel as Jewish people, never doing something like that, they were as proud to watch her walk the aisle, and then the following day come right back and watch her get married uh, by actually the two fathers, the father of the groom, and I'm his father of the bride. We, ma we married them. That, so that in that story, there was a coming around, if you will, uh, a recognition of, uh, maybe I shouldn't have done it, don't say that, would never say that, but... Uh, it's a happy ending to that particular story. And so I admire my parents for, for being willing to do that uh, and coming around. But it's hard. That's a hard thing to do. And not just from a Jewish point of view. This is Jewish culture, Jewish history, Jewish customs and culture. But traditions are very hard to overcome. Particularly in Judaism, God has separated a people. And that's for a purpose. Um, we believe that strongly. There will be a people when Jesus Christ returns, physically and bodily. Those people are his people, and they've been a separated people uh, from the time he called them, and they will be there when he returns. They must be there. So it's kind of an interesting thing when you know the rest of the story, but you're watching it in the middle, and you're trying to figure out, why, why do they do this? Why are they like that? Um, it is, it's part of our history and tradition and in, in, in the way we are. So, uh, alcohol. Oh, question. Um, I was going to say, I don't, I've never been to a um, Jewish community, but in the movies, like, if one person is a Jew and then they, they'll do, like, the ceremony, um, like, Jewish style, I guess but the other person is a Gentile, is that accurate? Like, would they do that? Now, you're talking about a Jewish person getting married to a Gentile mm -hmm. and the con in a movie, some movie, mm -hmm. and the context, were they in a synagogue? Uh, yeah. Where, okay, what, specifically, what's the question? Like, would they Why did they have a Jewish ceremony when there's oh, a Gentile there? Perform oh, who performs it? Not an Orthodox rabbi. The question is, in a, a wedding, if the couple is Jewish and Gentile, will a rabbi perform the ceremony? The Orthodox rabbi, if, if any Orthodox rabbi would say no. Why? That's a forbidden marriage. That goes, at, you must marry, and using Christian terms, equally yoke. The, the question could be asked, if you go to a, say, such and such church down the road where you know that they personally do not believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, that Jesus is the only way for salvation, but they're church. They have a minister and people go, uh, and a Jewish person wants to marry, quote, the Christian from that church. Will the pastor... Marry them. Answer? Probably. Probably. Will. Um, because the centrality of the scripture isn't held in the same esteem as another church down the road where the, uh, the minister or the person doing the, the wedding believes strongly in the word of God. So, would he do the wedding? Well, the answer to that is he would probably ask, this is a, in a Christian setting, he would probably ask the couple, have either of you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If the, of course, the Jewish person would say, well, no, I'm Jewish. The Gentile person 
could say, and it's happened, yes, I have. I've, I've encountered that. I, the, I have received Christ. No, the person I'm marrying has not. The person who pastors that church would say, I cannot perform the wedding. Why? You're unequally yoked. If, however, the two people said, no, we don't believe, neither one of us believes that Jesus is our Savior. Uh, but I, I'm, quote, Christian from this church, and he's Jewish, or she's Jewish from that. Then the Bible believer might indeed perform the wedding. Why? Because they're equally yoked.